My name is Richard C. Cook, and this is my new book, We Hold These Truths, The Hope of Monetary Reform. Welcome back to this six-part video entitled, Credit as a Public Utility, The Solution to the Economic Crisis. Part four is entitled, What is Credit and Who Should Control It? Credit is one of the central concepts of economics. The question we will be asking is, who should control it? The private banking system, the people's representative government, or some combination? The same question applies at the international level, and we will examine that also. But first, we must take a hard look at what is called fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking is the method banks use to create money out of thin air, as John Maynard Keynes put it, or to lend money they don't really have. The practice can be traced to the late Middle Ages, when European gold merchants would provide their customers with receipts for the gold they deposited in the gold merchants' vaults. These gold merchants would then lend out paper certificates to various borrowers over and above the value of the gold they were keeping in storage. The gold merchants assumed that not all the parties who ended up holding the gold receipts or certificates would show up at their doorstep at the same time to redeem them for their designated portion of actual gold. From an economic standpoint, the important thing was that the face value of the certificates in circulation was greater than the real gold. Dubious as this practice may have been, we can see how it would have benefited trade by allowing more exchange to take place than might otherwise have been the case. At the same time, the system gave some level of security of value to the holders of what was in reality paper money. The creation of credit in this way has properly been represented in the literature as a kind of fraud. In fact, money lending of any type was viewed at the time as a dirty occupation. Usury, or the charging of interest on lending, was outlawed by the Catholic Church. But credit did serve its purposes, even if it was not tied at all to gold. When commerce began to grow again after the European Dark Ages, it was done by the development of modern methods of banking and accounting, including the use of paper bills of credit among merchants, manufacturers, and governments. This credit was kept under control through the Real Bills Doctrine, which tied its issuance to commercial transactions based on the movement of actual goods in trade. But it was credit nonetheless. That is, it was based on a promise to pay later with something of value, not the intrinsic worth of some form of hard metallic currency. What the people of the Middle Ages had discovered was the tremendous power of credit to call forth human activity, to entice human beings to work at creating goods and services. Of course, actual gold or silver could have this effect, which is why the precious metals Spain brought back to Europe from its colonies in Central and South America provided the economic stimulus that helped create the Renaissance. But again, credit without gold or silver backing could do the same, including credit stored on account in banks as savings or in checking deposits. The key was trust, that the credit had real value, and the payment in something of worth would be later made. In fact, one of the great discoveries of modern times was that credit can be expanded infinitely, which upsets people because it points to how easily credit can be abused. This abuse can have serious consequences. For debtors to default and fall into the hands of your creditor is a great misfortune in earlier days, possibly leading to debtor's prison or even slavery. On the other hand, fraud or abuse by creditors could also lead to criminal sanctions, and still may. In fact, if one of those gold merchants failed to pay out gold for the certificates he issued through lending, he might even be executed by the town where he lived. 
So the ease by which credit can be created has serious dangers. As we see today, when irresponsible use of credit by banks or by a nation's central bank can destroy its economy. Still, the infinite potential for the expansion of credit in the field of economics corresponds to the great discovery by science that the energies of the universe are, for all practical purposes, infinite. Both indicate a universe of abundance, not one of lack or limitation. This is essential to remember in both good and bad economic times. The good news is that if the energies derived from credit can be channeled responsibly for human ends, tremendous increases in productivity can and have resulted. For credit is one of the keys to unleashing an incredible power of nature, a power that is stronger than gasoline, electricity, or even nuclear energy. This is the power of human effort and creativity as it is manifested through productive work. Thus the struggle throughout history to control and regulate credit came about, a struggle that has been waged among bankers, governments, and human populations. But because of the power of technology which credit can control, the stakes today are much higher than ever before. The bankers understand its power. Every merchant and industrialist understands it. So do working people and families. And statesmen like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt certainly understood it. Further, under an enlightened theory of governance, such as we find in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, it is easy to extrapolate that credit can and should be managed as a public utility, as indispensable in its own way as clean air, water, or electricity. Credit is akin to a power of nature, part of the commons that everyone should have access to, though like other utilities, its management can be licensed to a private entity or managed by a public authority. The concept of credit as a public utility, which I have originated in my writings, is the key to resolving the current economic crisis. As we have seen, Article I of the U.S. Constitution gives Congress the authority to create money, to tax, and to borrow on the credit of the United States. Further, any bank in the U.S. that generates credit can only operate under a federal or state government charter. Also, practices pertaining to the use of credit in commerce are enforceable in the courts under contract law. Thus the laws of the U.S. do imply that credit is a public utility at the most fundamental level, which reflects the nature of Republican government as forming a constitutional commonwealth among free citizens. Unfortunately, as we have seen, Congress largely privatized credit by turning it over to the financiers through the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864 and the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, as well as through more recent actions. This includes what the Federal Reserve is doing in 2009 by creating reserves entirely out of thin air, which it allocates to banks to induce them to restart their stalled lending. The Federal Reserve will do anything to prop up the debt-based monetary system. Now even the pretense of using Treasury debt as a reserve base has been abandoned as government debt as a source of bank assets is being bled dry. Congress, as usual, is a passive spectator. By allowing the total privatization of credit, Congress has wrecked the commonwealth of we the people that is the foundation of American governance. Congress will do anything to allow the banks to profit from inflationary, deflationary cycles as they always have. But this also means that the power of credit can be re-regulated or even taken away from the banks and administered by the people's representative government. 
This could be done on the basis of existing constitutional law, so the Constitution will not even have to be amended. Let's now talk about international finance. There is a movement today, led by the nations of Western Europe, to bring the entire world financial system under a greater degree of international control. On the international level, credit among nations has been managed mainly by the International Monetary Fund, the quasi-governmental agency of the U.S. and other Western banks, in lending to the national governments of other nations. Just as the banks within the U.S. create credit denominated in dollars, so does the IMF create credit through what they call Special Drawing Rights, or SDRs. SDRs came into existence after the world went off the gold standard in the 1970s. The value of the SDRs is pegged to four specific currencies. The U.S. dollar, the euro of the European Union, the Japanese yen, and the British pound. Just as within the United States, the financiers allow people, businesses, and governments to have access to credit only by paying interest, which is a de facto tax or rent attached to the use of the banker's credit monopoly, so does the IMF charge interest to nations receiving loans, mainly the nations of the so-called developing world. The interest charges are paid to the banks that work through the IMF so represent value exported out of the nation which has borrowed the money. In addition, nations which borrow from the IMF are required to open their economies to global capitalism and make various concessions that may be against the interests of their own populations. During recent years, there had been a trend of developing nations experiencing enough economic growth that they no longer were having to depend on the IMF. But with the current economic crisis becoming global, this prosperity is being reversed. The IMF and the banks are moving again to become the lender of last resort to the world's nations, which are being warned not to take such emergency measures as aiding consumers by subsidizing the cost of food. This requirement is being imposed despite the fact that global climate change has resulted in severe drought conditions in many nations, thus leading to food shortages. Today, the IMF is moving to reduce the economic sovereignty even of developed countries. This is what is happening to Iceland, for example, after its banking system collapsed due to its weak assets and overextended lending. It is happening to the nations of Eastern Europe. Lately, the nations of the European Union have been calling for reforms of the world financial system to be led by the IMF. It could end up putting even the U.S. under a degree of IMF control. The case of the IMF shows the extraordinary power the banking system has over the economies of the world. But it's through the very act of issuing credit as interest-bearing loans that the bankers everywhere in the world cause the wealth of humanity to constantly flow into their pockets as the rental cost of money. Internationally, entire nations can be controlled and impoverished this way, even if they have abundant resources and an educated, talented population fully capable of producing what they need to support their own national economies. Through the control of credit, the financial system has made the rich richer, the poor poorer, and the middle class increasingly endangered around the world. Every financial activity and every dollar people earn is subject to a hidden financial tax levied by the financiers through interest, fees, the creation and collapse of financial bubbles, and the takeover of assets when people and businesses are forced into default or foreclosure. Today we are watching the world credit system crash. Many people, as well as intelligence agencies, fear that the social unrest that is resulting may lead to a worldwide breakdown of law and order. Riots have broken out around the world 
and warnings have been given about the same thing happening in the U.S. But it shouldn't happen this way. Instead of preparing to take steps that could lead to locking up their own populations, the U.S. and other governments should take back control of credit from the financiers and manage it for the benefit of the people. Some would call this socialism. But I don't call Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, or Abraham Lincoln socialists. I call the system they believed in constitutional government. Congress today could easily pass laws for management of the monetary and credit system, not by the financiers, but by our representative government. The same could be done in other nations. Systematic measures for the public control and administration of money and credit will be addressed later in this video. But to prepare the ground, we must understand more about the nature of a modern industrial economy and how the financial system exploits certain structural characteristics to its advantage. This will then allow us to discuss a monetary and credit system that would be constitutional, would treat credit as the public utility it really is, and provide an effective monetary and credit system for our country and its economy. Thank you for watching.